Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Lei Hua, your favorite data scientist at YouTube. In today's video, I'm going to show you guys how we can uh, run A-B testing to uh, better understand our users and how we can run A-B testing to uh, better answer business questions. All right, let's get started. And uh, uh, let's say our business partners, they want to uh, change the website color to from uh, blue to black and they want to understand how this new change will affect our uh, user engagement here user engagement is measured as uh, you know uh, user reading time or you can uh, measure it using another metric um, as long as you justify your choice and the metric uh, is consistent with your hypothesis uh, you know, uh, then uh, we are fine. Uh, for the, uh, how, how can we approach this question? So the most uh, straightforward way of doing it is to uh, simply roll out in the new uh, new color to all users. Then let's, uh, let's see how uh, how user engagement like metric will, will change. But uh, the downside of it is we don't know how the new change uh, will affect our like users you know uh, it can be the effect can be positive or negative or neutral we just don't know and if we roll out the feature without actively uh, testing it then uh, we may lose our users or we may hurt our users you know if users do not like the new change then they may decrease their reading time or they will uh, churn from website, right? So this is a very very risky and uh, we in production environment We cannot uh, Tolerate this type of like uh, uh, Risk so a more reasonable approach to this question is to a B testing using only a small subset of users Let's say the new design or the new color has uh, slightly negative like effect then we can uh, uh, rely on our pipeline and the reporting like system to detect the decrease early on and end the experiment so in this way our uh, there, there were still a, a risk uh, of testing it right but uh, the risk can be quantified and uh, drastically reduced if we use the proper stat st statis statistical methods Okay, and uh, here is a like a simplified version of uh, A-B testing. It has like four steps, treatment assignment, uh, track user behaviors, data analysis, and uh, decision making. Uh, of course, in a uh, real uh, life like uh, experimentation platform, uh, there will be more uh, like, uh, you know, uh, components attached to the workflow. But uh, for today's video, I want to make things uh, easier and simple, simpler to uh, so you guys can understand better, right? So in the next slide, I will introduce some like uh, uh, statistical considerations uh, uh, with uh, uh, like uh, each step. So for for the first step, treatment assignment, the first thing we should do is to uh, we need to decide the user, the unit of randomization and the unit of analysis. Um, the naming is not that is not that helpful, and I will do my best to explain the difference. So the unit of randomization means the at which unit do you want to randomize your uh, assignment? Okay, yeah. is it a unit based? Uh, is it a, like a user based like uh, a random randomization, or is it is uh, like a city based? You know, or is it a country based like uh, assignment? You know, all uh, all users in one country they will receive the treatment, and all users from another country they will use uh, uh, they will be exposed to the control condition, and the, the the unit of analysis is the at which level do we want to conduct uh, like our data, okay? M for most of the case, online experimentation uh, has the you know the unit of randomization and the unit of analysis they are the same for online experimentation. And uh, if they are the same, then the statistical analysis is uh, very straightforward and simple. But uh, if there is a discrepancy between the unit of randomization and the unit of analysis, then we have to be more careful with our uh, statistical analysis because the 
analysis cannot be is is no longer so straightforward, and we have to apply more advanced uh, like stati statistical methods to do the analysis. Uh, I will uh, maybe post another video on how we can do it. Okay, then the random uh, process. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the treatment assignment process is a truly random process and the users uh, have a, a consistent like a treatment assignment which means like users who are assigned to the treatment group will stay in the treatment group users who are assigned to the control group will stay in the control group this is very very important because from the causal inference perspective you know we want to ensure the stable unit treatment value assumption or suitable because if we if there's like uh, if users who are assigned to the treatment but ended up in the control group you know it it is possible you know for this type of like flicker to to happen um, then the uh, suitable assumption will be violated and we cannot do the uh, data inference and uh, in online experimentation we rely on uh, hashing a process called hashing to do the randomization for us and basically we apply the hashing algorithm to the combination of uh, experimentation ID and uh, and uh, user ID. Then we take module and uh, assign it to different buckets. Uh, in the end, we run the experiments, you know, uh, using different buckets. Um, users who are assigned to the uh, to to the to a specific bucket will stay in the bucket and stay in the treatment condition throughout the experimentation duration. That's why online experimentation is often called uh, uh, bucket-based experiments, okay? And uh, there are, uh, on a side note, there are so many hashing algorithms that we can use. Uh, there's no one hashing algorithm that uh, fits with all types of, uh, you know, um, tech companies or all types of uh, uh, testing scenarios. So uh, we need to come up with some design principles to pick the best algorithm. For example, one of our design principles is to ensure that uh, uh, the hashing process has a very low latency. Okay, so let's uh, we can uh, run the experiments and uh, using uh, using different uh, uh, hash algorithms, then we can compare which algorithm gives us the uh, lowest uh, latency. Of course, there are so many different like. Uh, uh, you know considerations or factors that, that we want to uh, keep in mind and uh, uh, the the rule of th uh, the rule of thumb is to come up with different design principles and uh, uh, let's apply the hashing algorithms and then we check the end results okay uh, if they stay uh, if they uh, if they are consistent with our uh, design principle then we will choose the uh, the best uh, hashing algorithm based on their performance okay and the next uh, uh, step is check is to check user behaviors so uh, it has you know uh, it means uh, we need to uh, record or register our user behaviors or user events if they if they are triggered and uh, we do not want uh, any data loss Oh, we don't want to uh, uh, to observe any systematic or data loss in one group but not in other. If there's a systematic data loss in one group uh, but not in the other, then we will introduce uh, like a selection bias, uh, you know, during the uh, process, and the uh, experiment results become uh, untrustworthy, and we cannot uh, move on to the next step. You know, if there's if if something happen, if something goes wrong, we should uh, do the uh, root cause analysis and uh, identify the the reasons why it happened, and then we rerun the uh, experiment and regenerate uh, clean like data. All right. The third step is data analysis. Uh, we are going to use the uh, most common. Uh, statistical method which is called the two sample t-test uh, you know for our uh, exam as our example you know for so commonly in, in the industry we want to achieve 80% like power threshold and we want to collect enough data 
uh, to ensure we have reached the uh, the required uh, required power. Uh, if we do not have enough sample, or if the the variance of the experiment uh, is way too big, then we may not be able to uh, you know uh, fulfill the eighty percent power. Okay, so for this case, we need to think hard about uh, um, alternatives. Uh, you know, one common way we can do is to uh, we can apply some more advanced statistical methods to reduce the variance. If if the variance is reduced, then the required sample will be uh, will be de de uh, reduced. And uh, in other words, we can achieve the eighty percent power easily if we have a reduced uh, variance. Okay, and we during the data analysis, uh, you know, another uh, uh, factor is. We do not want to peek into the experiment results when the experiment is uh, still running, because uh, uh, continuously monitoring the experiment results and uh, uh, we were uh, we we were increase the false positive rate uh, for fixed horizon tests. Okay, and also in the end, when we want to uh, to do any data analysis, we want to check the statistical assumption of uh, two sample t tests, right? So for two sample t t test, one of the assumptions is the data uh, needs to be normally distributed. Okay, if it's a skewed uh, data distribution, then two sample t, t test is not a good choice. Uh, uh, in the end, we uh, need to make uh, decisions based on the experiment uh, like uh, results. Uh, here, uh, things become uh, less clear because. Uh, we need to combine both a practical uh, consideration and also statistical consideration into our uh, like uh, decision making process. For practical uh, consideration, uh, I mean, well, you know, our change needs to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, needs to make uh, business sense, right? And uh, for statistical sense, you know, uh, I mean, uh, our results, our data distribution, our uh, you know, final results need to uh, support our hypothesis. Uh, if, uh, in order to do this, we need to uh, introduce uh, some contextual information, such as how we generate the, the hypothesis, you know, because, bec um, you know, uh, one common explanation or one common justification for hypothesis is based on customer, uh, consumer psychology, you know, if we change one color to, uh, to if we change blue color to black color, then uh, users they become more active. You know, there's a psychology component to it, right? Or you you, you can generate the hypothesis based on other like factors, but uh, the uh, the key part here is we need to uh, both consider the statistical you know factors and also consider the statistical evidence and also the business like uh, value. And combine these two and make uh, the final call. Uh, so here, actually, you may get into a, like fight fight with your uh, with your like uh, business partners because you know there will be a lot of uh, like disagreements here. Uh, so here are the uh, common reasons why experiments fail. You know, uh, the first one is as I just mentioned. You know, the uh, the levels of uh, randomization and the level of uh, analysis can be uh, can be difficult to understand for some like a beginner, uh, beginner uh, data scientists, and they use the incorrect uh, like levels of randomization or incorrect level of uh, analysis. For example, uh, there is a uh, user interference, and we cannot use uh, user level randomization because if you assign the uh, randomization based on uh, uh, to each u uh, user and each user they are correlated they are all they are inter there's an interference between them then your results will be biased so for this this type of scenario we have to use uh, maybe other uh, alternatives so one of the alternative uh, is uh, to use a cluster randomization so actually this is a very uh, this is a commonly used uh, methodology in a lot of uh, like uh, social media companies, because uh, for their testing scenario, their users they are uh, correlated within a particular network, right? So uh, they will use uh, cluster randomization instead of a unit level randomization. 
uh, the another common reason is uh, people run uh, a lot of like uh, you know underpowered uh, experiments, which means uh, uh, you know they collect uh, inefficient or insufficient like uh, sample size, and uh, they uh, they make uh, inferences based on the uh, underpowered uh, you know uh, data. It is very risky because uh, you just uh, cannot detect the lift if you uh, if you have a very uh, like a, a small sample okay and also picking as I mentioned continuously monitoring uh, you know the the experiment results can uh, can increase your false positive rate like uh, significantly and another one is uh, data or we have data loss in one group but not in other so uh, uh, this is very common actually in, in online experimentation and the terminology for this for this scenario is called uh, uh, sample ratio mismatch and uh, we need to be very very careful with this uh, like scenario uh, with this like uh, 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 scenario because uh, if we have uh, in unbalanced uh, sample sizes between the treatment control groups it means we have uh, there's some reasons why uh, one group has a, a, a larger a sample size than the other and uh, in other words we have incorporated like uh, um, you know buyers in the process okay uh, and finally I have uh, some I have included a few uh, uh, you know uh, resources for for you guys the first one is trustworthy online controlled experiments and this is the best uh, uh, textbook on online experimentation and uh, Personally, I have uh, uh, you know uh, read it uh, maybe five or six times, you know, and uh, also here we have some uh, you know uh, median lists that uh, uh, compile uh, uh, you know uh, dozens of uh, blog posts of how um, modern tech companies they run experiments. Uh, they are very very useful, and personally, I have. Uh, you know, uh, went through every single uh, like article uh, multiple times, and each time I read it, I can learn something new. So it's very helpful. You know, uh, you know, if you want to step into the data science world and uh, work in uh, in online experimentation. All right, that's all from today's video, and uh, hope you guys learned something new. And uh, see you next time. Bye.